We now have a collaboration. Our next uh, participants are Timothy Taylor, Christina Tautendorfer, and Ken Rader. Professor Timothy Taylor teaches in the Department of Archaeological Sciences at the University of Bradford. And in November 2012, we become professor of the prehistory of humanity at the University of Vienna. His very influential books on the evolution of sex and gender, burial, and also ritual, killing, and technology, and also the practical arts, have been translated into several languages and have inspired many, many of the artists we've been working with in the preparation of this marathon. Timothy's work is so relevant in relation to this idea of Herzog Dömeron and Ai Weiwei of the uh, pavilion being a memory forum and of the pavilion being an archaeological site of all the previous pavilions. Ken Ryder is a freelance photographer obsessed with glamour and decay. Today, Timothy Taylor, Ken Ryder, and Christina Tautendorfer, Taylor's scarpomorphic alter ego, will present a portrait of Giulio Camillo. A very, very warm welcome to them. There is no uh, known portrait of Giulio Camillo. This is not him. Uh, he died in 1544, a century before Velasquez's Venus at her mirror. Female nudes were reviled by the Inquisition. Paravicino, a connoisseur who sat for El Greco, said, <clears throat> the finest paintings are the greatest threat. Burn the best of them. The Catholic Church permitted only young men to sit naked for artists. The identity of Velasquez's sitter remains unknown, though he had a mistress during his stay in Rome. Certainly, his ultimate model was Roman, a second century AD version of a lost Hellenistic bronze hermaphrodite excavated in 1608 near the Baths of Diocletian. It was presented to Cardinal Borghese and eventually found its way to the Louvre. Velasquez ordered a bronze copy to take back with him to Madrid. The Venus arrived in 1813 at Rokeby Park in the old North Riding of Yorkshire and in 1906 was acquired for the National Gallery. In 1914, the suffragette, later head of the women's section of the British Union of Fascists, Mary Richardson, attacked it. Perhaps lacking matches, she worked in the spirit of Paravicino with a meat cleaver, lacerating the back to produce a partial SM tableau that survives now only in the pre-restoration photograph. Iconoclasm is as old as the urge to make images. The visceral power of the skewer morph, the form rendered in other material, involuntarily excites, arousing, perhaps at least in the case of the vast ancient Greek fallacies of Delos, jealousy. Camillo, the most famous European scholar of his age, was a contemporary of Giulio Romano, a selection of whose pornography Shakespeare possessed. Romano created temporary works for masks and festivities, painting Jupiter seducing Olympia for a Mantuan banquet held in honor of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V in 1530. The same year, Camillo was commissioned by Francis I to construct a memory theater. He created an immensely complex structure whose secret mechanism was packed with boxes filled with objects ordered under the aspects of the seven planetary gods and their attributes. The theater promised a means by which all knowledge could be remembered by the association of images with specific ideas. Each physical image was chosen for its uniquely striking aspect. Camillo understood art not as illusion, but as the concretization of reality, where things were placed so carefully in relationship to one another that once arranged, they became eternal, their meaning universally understood, at least among an exclusive body of initiates. Each aisle and circle of his theater corresponded to the planetary symbols, seven by seven. Mercury, Diana, Apollo, Mars, 
Jupiter, Venus, Saturn. Each deity had its own attributes, such as the scallop shell used by Venus to grind her cosmetics. I have chosen a scallop shell with traces of pigments that dates to 50,000 years ago, excavated in Cueva Anton, Spain, and once used by Neanderthals at their toilet. I have also chosen a bone comb typical of the Iron Age of Atlantic Scotland, well used in antiquity and then broken. These two pieces were recovered by archaeologists at the site of Gigan Rock, East Lothian. A 19.2 centimeter, seven and a half inch phallus made in finely polished stone between 26 and 30,000 years ago at the Ice Age site of Holofels, Germany. Termed a retoucher or retouching tool, the wear pattern at its tip shows that it was used to provide the finish to penetrative projectiles, at least some of the time. A perforated stone, like a quern stone, from the hill fort of Broxmouth, southern Scotland. The world's earliest surviving marionette, carved in mammoth ivory, and after around 25,000 years in the ground incomplete, found with the red ochre stained bones of its former animator in a ritual cache under the center of Brno in the Czech Republic. A stag's antler, symbol of Diana, as of Canunas, also from Broxmouth, and not made of stag's antler. It was cast uniquely in pure iron, making it another skewermore for transmogrification of a form familiar previously only in a different substance. Seventh, Giulio Camillo's theatre. Its lost substance of gated aisles and graded circles loosely conjured in this posthumous schema. Camillo claimed it to be a direct aid for the recall of the past, serving to assign what he called frail things their eternal places. Constructed with 500 ducats from the French king, not one piece survived into the 17th century. I enter the theatre as my female skeuomorphic alter ego, constructed through cosmetic and prosthetic technology on a receding biological substrate. A portrait image for Virginia Enor's work, Oh My God, Où la recherche de l'Olisbos perdu. Seven colors for seven unknown states of mind. Before Christina's makeup comes off in an act of iconoclasm, which of course, has its own iconography. which in turn prefaces a view of the world's earliest oil paintings, seventh century AD Buddhist icons largely destroyed by the Taliban within the rock cut niches at Bamiyan. Preserved now as images on fading film in the Western Himalaya archive in Vienna. Pocked as they already were, defaced literally, eyes, nose and mouth, the locus of atavistic destruction, 
row after row, erasing identity from memory. Because as the faces look out, they penetrate us through our eyes, involuntarily entering, forcing a reaction against their destabilizing and amoral potency. In the final seventh grade, I alight as winged Mercury in the North Riding of Yorkshire, displacing a white barn owl. I remember I was Diana entering the retreat of her prey. As Apollo, I'm amused by the memory of turning the owl white raven black for bearing me news of Coronis's unfaithfulness. I remember when I was Mars, my breath condensed in my mask and I could not see. As Jupiter, I reflected that I must be pictured hurling down thunderbolts. Combing my hair, I remember I did not want to think of stripping my eyelashes from my eyes, Venus fearing always demotion. As the moon rose, Christina was Saturn and Memento Mori. Recalling her absence, I realized that I also will not always be present. Seven images and 49 are needed to build the memory theater in its seven grades. Ordered by the ancient artifacts and by the planetary symbols, by the ephemerality of mood, the logic of destruction, the salvaged fragments of identity, and the whims of the gods, winged Mercury perched high, Diana entering as the huntress, Apollo accepting lost love, Mars battle blind, Jupiter seen in myself, Venus at her mirror, Saturn memento mori. So here we present to you a memory theater as portrait not Giulio Camillo's face, never painted, nor his recorded speech impediment, but an alchemical and digital memory of a windowed soul. This is the shape of his mind's chambers and the modes of their associations, which are given a fleeting and particular symbolic materialization.